Hello, friends, and welcome back to this week's episode of The Embodied Healing Self. This week's guest I am very excited to share with you is Dr. Keith Holden. Keith is a physician with a practice in functional medicine. He is also the author of the book, The Power of the Mind in Health and Healing, and also of an online course in The Power of the Mind in Health and Healing. So Keith, Dr. Holden, thank you so much for being here today. I'm so grateful to be able to share you with our listeners. I'm very happy to be here. Please call me Keith. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we don't need any formality. It's okay. <laughs> well, you did earn it. It is a part well, of your experience and who you are, but thank you for that. So I'm going to start out by just bringing the listeners in and sharing my uh, first becoming of you in my life, which was four years ago. So in four years ago, which is now, what, 2015, in the beginning of the year, um, I was searching for, I was in a time of my life where I had really just been recovering from being in a health crisis of taking care of my kids for five or six years and just becoming aware of my own need to take care of myself. And so I was searching specifically for a doctor who practiced functional medicine. And the two names that I kept finding were you and Dr. Kessler, who I know is a, mm -hmm. is a, as a friend and um, colleague of yours and whom i I also do work with. So um, I was able to get into an office to see you. And in that time, you were in transition from your practice of functional medicine, where you were beginning to share this new book and this course that you had created. So um, as a patient, I actually only saw you once in the office. And around that same time, I happened to, unbeknownst to me, I was stepping into really my second health crisis. And... Um, through the path of that, the results of that took me down a path of being offered many traditional choices, which of course there is a time and place for those choices. But in that moment, I had known enough to know that I had a choice for something else. And so I went through my process and I did, I, I chose some alternative methods to healing, which worked well for me. And then a few months later, you gifted me your course. And at this time in my life, what my, my intuition was telling me before this health crisis showed up was that I was eating really, really healthy at this time. I had a health coaching practice for five years. I had had so much success in healing the, our physical bodies through nutrition with my daughter and myself. I mean, we were in such a good place. I was at the peak of eating clean and I still had a health crisis. Mm -hmm. So that knowing the fact that my physical body, I mean, I was feeling so energized and so healthy. I really felt so resilient and I still had a health crisis. So I took a step back and was like, okay, so what is there for me to learn? And I, again, altered the course of my life. I began meditation. Um, I did my yoga teacher training and started to honor and listen to the idea that health was not food can heal, but that's not the answer for everything, which was a belief that I had had until this point in time. And in divine timing, you gifted me this course and asked for feedback and it was, it couldn't have been more perfect. Um, so I took this course, which included meditation. And so I'm at a point in my life where I was looking for that balance of traditional medicine and spiritual awareness. And how meditation can help the body and how you know healing our emotions can help the body and so coming from you as a physician with a background in functional medicine felt like a safe place for me to be able to receive the information so i thank you for that and ever since that moment in time i've been a very big fan in sharing your work um it thank is thank you Yes, absolutely. And it, it's, it's been integrated in the work that I do because as a health coach, I began to learn 
okay, well, we, we have a um, heart space to heal. We have a mindset. There's meditation. There's all these other avenues to, which is where the idea of embodied healing self came from, that are a part of our whole being. And so you were really a part of just that, that door opening for me. And it felt, again, I, you know, when we started this conversation calling you Dr. Holden, like it was, it was a space where it felt safe for me because what you bring, what you offer is that balance between traditional medicine and the science behind how the physical body heals. And then also that spiritual concept and the epigenetics of meditation, the placebo effect. And I think it's a wonderful place and opportunity for people to become empowered in their own health choices. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah. So thank you. So that, so I wanted to share that with the listeners and I want to start out by asking you about your own personal journey. Many of the guest speakers that I have on here have become passionate about the work that they do and helping others to heal through their own journeys. And I know that you have had your own journey as well. So would you be willing to share your personal journey on how you got to where you are today? Absolutely. And uh, so it starts as um, as an infant. Actually, it started in utero. My, my mom uh, was blessed to have twins, but with that, we were very large babies, and we were cramped in utero. Um, my twin was born with um, problems with his legs. He needed to wear uh, corrective shoes and braces. I don't, they don't treat it the same way now, but that's how it was done back then. And I had to wear, I, I was born with a floppy neck and my shoulder, my head just rested on my shoulder and I had a crossed eye, strabismus. And um, so the first thing my parents did when, when mom was out of the hospital and we were doing okay, she, they took us directly to the chiro family chiropractor. And, uh, you know, back in 1964, that was complete voodoo. And uh, I mean, still some people consider chiro chiropractic voodoo now, but I mean, really back then it was pretty harsh. In fact, the AMA tried to squash chiropractors. So anyway, took us to uh, Dr. Eastman. And I remember Dr. Eastman vividly because I grew up with him as one of my physicians. And like I like to say, a healer is a healer. And Dr. Eastman was a healer. He, he just had his own unique and what some might consider an alternative way of helping individuals heal. And so he adjusted my tiny little body a few times and my eye uncrossed and my neck strengthened. And she did what he asked her to do with me at home as far as specific exercises and movements of my body. And I didn't need to see a traditional doctor for those two problems I was born with, they corrected. And so once I became aware of that story as I was growing up, I always held uh, chiropractors in, in, in a very special way. I, I looked up to them. In fact, one of my uncles is, is a chiropractor and he, he would adjust us on when we'd get together on uh, family Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever. So I was completely used to being adjusted. And I really, at the time as a kid, I wasn't very highly aware of how controversial they were. I just knew that Dr. Eastman had helped me and uh, helped me to heal. And so I grew up with that knowledge. And then uh, my grandmother was a, a big advocate of natural healing methods, methods using plants and herbs and uh, just common sense, actually. And so I, I was aware of those, those ways of being uh, brought up to where you didn't run to the doctor for every, every little thing. You used what you had at your disposal in a, in a common sense method. And most of the time the body was able to heal because it's always trying to heal itself. It just needs a little support, especially when you're a kid, you know. So anyway, uh, I ended up going to medical school at LSU School of Medicine in New Orleans and had a very solid traditional um, medical background. I graduated in the top of my class and I loved it. I loved the structured learning environment. I love being challenged intellectually. I loved um, working with other like-minded individuals. And 
and and I'll be honest with you, some of the process of of uh, modern medical training is some brainwashing. I mean, you have to. You, you're you're dealing with people's lives, so you're it's reinforced how important it is for you to do things a certain way, and it's you know it's all based evidence based is what they call it. Uh, and evidence-based medicine is a good idea, but if, if taken to an extreme, just like anything, it can create harm. For example, if somebody has multiple health issues and you use evidence-based medicine to decide what met- medicines they should be on, you're going to, they'll end up resulting in a issue called polypharmacy, where they're on too many medicines that have overlapping side effects and then they're sick from the medicine. And that was evidence-based. So you see how you can take, uh, a, a a method that was meant to help people and take it too far, even with traditional mainstream medicine and cause problems. But we know that we see elderly people with polypharmacy all the time, mainly because they have so many health conditions by the time they reach that age. So I saw those things and I, I didn't jump in a hundred percent in what I was taught. I, I took what I thought was going to help my patients and do no harm, which is, of course, that's the oath we take when we graduate from medical school, do no harm. And I I put that first and foremost. And so when I started practicing, well, I actually did my residency in internal medicine, and I was loving it just as much as I love medical school because you're constantly learning and constantly challenging yourself. And then I stepped out into a community-based practice and left academia and it was kind of like wow is this it is this you know you're seeing head colds and back pain and you're kind of you're kind of starting to see the mundane and you lose that that excitement that you once had and I also was seeing patients that weren't getting well despite doing everything I was trained that needed to be done for them and so I started looking a little deeper and say, why aren't these people getting well? Where is the missing link? What was I not taught in medical school that I'm not able to use to get them better? And doctors will tell you, oh, just some people won't get well. You know, that was the fallback. Well, that may be true for some, but it's not true for a lot of people. What I found is that you've got to create an integrative type practice and address the mind, body, and spirit, not just the body to truly make a person whole. And even then, some people will not cure, but they will heal if you take that approach. And by healing, I mean, you if you address the mind, body, spirit aspects, they may become okay with their yes. disease process and do well despite it, but yes. they didn't necessarily cure. And so that's a very important concept for people to understand. And that's what I love about integrative medicine. You can heal without curing, but in many ways, you, you can also cure them. If you, if you hadn't just, if you'd have just used traditional medicine, you might not have healed or cured them. So there's many variables that come into play, but thankfully I found functional medicine and I love functional medicine because it filled in all the blanks that medical school left out. It taught me to really address nutrition as a core component of wellness, which you may have a couple of hours of nutrition training back when I was in medical school. I don't know how it is now, but it was really pretty pathetic uh, because you truly can use food as medicine. It's proven in the scientific literature. And um, so you're taught to create a therapeutic partnership with your patient, engage them so that they're playing an active role and taking responsibility for their health instead of just being this traditional medicine authoritarian and telling them what to do. Now, granted, some patients like that. They want to be told what to do. They don't want to take responsibility for their health. And those patients may not be the ideal functional medicine candidate. So in training in functional medicine, I found all these tricks and 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 brought in these integrative techniques that would address the whole person. And I found in a lot of times, wow, that was the key. That was the missing piece of the puzzle. That's when more of my patients started getting well. And when I started out on my own functional medicine practice, I was seeing patients that were coming to me saying, doc, you're my last hope. I've been to this this specialist, this specialist, this specialist, 
he, they say, they just don't seem to want to put everything together and talk to each other. They're, they're treating me like one doctor treats this and another doctor treats that, and it's just not working. So a lot of those patients would come see me. Was it stressful? Sure. But was it exciting? Yes, because I had a lot of the pieces of the puzzle that their doctors didn't have thanks to functional medicine and some other types of training that I had done on using uh, electroceuticals or energy medicine devices. And so it was an exciting time and I was able to bring everything together and create a book and a course, uh, kind of a best of practices that I found as it relates to mind-body medicine because in the end, I found that mind-body medicine was my favorite of all aspects of medicine. How the mind and the body interact, how the mind can influence ill health or good health. And I found that was a common denominator in people who weren't getting well. It was that mind-body connection where there was a disconnect or in many instances, unresolved emotional trauma that became these unresolved emotional conflicts residing in their, in their psyche that created this ongoing chronic sub-therapeutic stressor that eventually became, it reared its ugly head and created dizzy, dis-ease. And they, they started developing health issues from it, whether it was a phys- physical, emotional, or both. Um, and so that's why it became my favorite because it seems to be a common denominator in people that aren't getting well, that mind-body connection. And I, I had, real quick and aside, I had my, when I was all excited about integrative medicine, I was just jumping in with both feet and I made some mistakes along the way. And one of the mistakes was I decided to get all my mercury fillings pulled in one day. So I had seven mercury fillings pulled in one day without proper protection. Um, Three weeks later, my stomach looks like I'm six months pregnant. Um, I developed the worst case of irritable bowel syndrome known to man. Just, I was losing weight, eating 5,000 calories a day. I thought I was dying. I finally went to a gastroenterologist. They scoped me upper and lower, and they found that I had ulcers in my colon. And the pathology did not show ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, which is, which are known inflammatory bowel diseases, they said, oh, no, these are aphthous ulcers, kind of like people get in their mouths, those little, Mm -hmm. you might call them cankers or whatever. Um, So my body had gone into dysregulation after it had that excessive mercury load. It had been, my, my amalgams had been leaching mercury over time, but the final blow was when they drilled them out and vaporized all that mercury and I breathed it in and it settled in my vagus nerve and my gut and it just created havoc. And so thankfully I've learned functional medicine because they gave me this medicine for inflammatory bowel disease. It made me sicker and that was my time to shine. Okay, you let's take what you've learned and use it. And I used every trick in the book, every mind body as- medicine aspect, all the functional medicine, the nutraceuticals, you know, did genomic testing, found where my SNPs were, my single nucleotide polymorphisms, et cetera, all the wonderful things that functional medicine has to offer, the cutting edge medicine, which actually big wigs like Cleveland Clinic are starting to embrace today Mm -hmm. uh, because it's cutting edge medicine and functional medicine was way ahead of the curve. And I used all those tricks and I got better and I was able to heal myself and actually cure myself of the severe irritable bowel syndrome. And some of it did take um, taking the DMPS to pull the mercury from my body. And that's, that's a whole nother issue, but I am saying functional medicine absolutely works. Um, And to keep from going crazy during that time, meditation and mindfulness was key. So that's kind of where I got to where I am today. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, I'm a huge fan of functional medicine. It's it's how I found you. And now in my own practice, I partner with Dr. Kessler, who is a local functional medicine doctor. And I love that it integrates 
well, it's client based. So it's, it's, um, you know, focused on the particular or patient based on the patient, not the symptoms or the dis-ease itself, but really just the person as a whole. And like you said, what I found in my own health coaching practice on a similar path that you saw in your medical practice is that it's not just about the physical body, that there are these deeper layers that do show up and sometimes they show up as a repeating pattern. And that theme in the guest speakers that I've had on the show is known in the world of alternative medicine and healing and alternative just in another pathway to healing the body that we realize we recognize that there are these deeper layers of of healing that can be accessed and what i love that you said in the very beginning is you said that our body wants to heal our body is always healing and that is how I came up with the name of this podcast, the embodied healing self, because really if we, if we can slow down and lean into all the different messages that we receive from our body, it knows what it needs and what it wants. We just, we just have to give it, nourish it, give it the love and attention or whatever it's asking for. It could be physical connection with a person it could be intimacy it could be nutrition it could be minerals it could be um you know healing a core wound from childhood trauma like those are all the different mm. parts of our healing self so i really love that you said that because hearing that come from a physician who's practiced traditional medicine and then went on a path to integrative medicine and functional medicine is just, it, it paints a picture that allows us to see that this is possible. And I think what my hope is in sharing this is, is empowering people to know that there are other ways in my own personal life. You talked about, um, I forget the word you use, polypharmacy. So mm -hmm. I think I forget what you said, but in my life as a parent, and the reason I got into health coaching is because my oldest daughter at the age of three was on six prescription drugs. And that was the sickest that she ever was. And I knew yeah. it in my gut. I knew it in my heart. And I finally just gave in to what I knew was true, that it was making her sick just in, in, it may work, have worked for other children, but it didn't work for her. And then we began this path of, you know, alternative medicine. So we, as you're speaking, I've lived through a lot of what you share is possible. And also, you know, just coming to that understanding of um, the different parts and layers that are asking to be healed. So thank you for that. I want to dive a little bit deeper into the science behind meditation. Um, the, we can call it the epigenetics of meditation or maybe some science-based or evidence-based facts that you know have been shown. Now that you've shared your personal story with us, would you be willing to share how you got more interested in that while integrating the science behind it with your own personal experience. Yeah, I want to first say that um, going back to some of your comments and my my path, I, I really want want to say I prefer the term complementary medicine than alternative because alternative medicine gets bashed by by skeptics, um, and it's semantics, but it's still a nice way to kind of create a pathway, a bridge to blend the two and create a truly integrative type approach. So I like to say complementary medicine. And, and, and when I say complementary, it truly means complementing the care you're getting in a traditional healthcare setting. Because I think having a, a MD or a DO or a, a, a good nurse practitioner or a good PA that's overseen by a good physician is very important. Um, they can look at things from a different perspective than say your, your integrative doc can. Um, they, they, it's, it's good to have more than one person participating in your care. And if you find a, 
a, a traditional medicine doctor that you're just not happy with, hey, go find someone else. There's plenty of traditional medicine doctors out there now who are open to all this that we're talking about, meditation, mindfulness, nutrition. There are plenty of them out there now. There's, there's been a shift. Um, yes. I, I look back at Medscape, which, is, which was a resource for, tra for traditional medicine doctors. Just in the past 10, 10 years, they are starting to embrace the functional medicine concepts like crazy. I never would have thought I've seen it, would have seen it. But it's functional medicine is based on legit science. And because it's based on legit science, more and more doctors are embracing functional medicine concepts, even dabbling it a little bit, but that's fine. That just means they're open-minded and that means you've probably found the right doctor. So if you're not happy with your traditional doctor, don't just abandon traditional medicine. It has yeah. some great potential to offer, especially in an acute care setting or yeah. trauma. So don't alienate it, embrace it, but just find the right doc. So that's my yeah. preachiness on that. Yeah, yeah, thank you for thank you so much for the clarity on that and just in just uh, shifting the words around because I think the what I see is the true philosophy of an integrative or functional medicine approach is that is that you know that there is a time and a place for either one and that they can be integrated together. And yeah. I know in my own personal life, traditional medicine saved my life when my daughter was born, like literally completely saved my life. So um, it, yeah. as it continues to save many lives around me as, you know, watching my parents in their aging process. And so mm -hmm. 100%, if we could get to a place where, like you said, maybe people are not considering functional medicine as a last result, that would be right. wonderful. Yeah. Like if we can just exactly. kind of see it all on the table as opportunity and availability where there is no separation. It's just that it's mm -hmm. all integrated and available in what's best for the current patient at this particular time in their life. So it, thank it's you coming. For that. It's, it's absolutely it's coming. It's being consumer driven and, and uh, medicine is consumer driven and, and Cleveland clinics got a great functional medicine department and, and next thing you know, Mayo will be doing it, and it'll, it, it'll be all over the place. So we're on the way. So I want to go back to your first your question before I introduce that caveat, and that is, how did I get into meditation? And I just intuitively knew that I needed to bring meditation into my life. I'm a highly analytical thinker, constantly, constantly spinning plates in my head, uh, uh, recovering control freak, you know, I just too, too intellectual for my own good. I, I love to think I love to read, but when you're constantly in your head like that, it creates a lot of stress. So I was like, how can I get out of my head? Uh, of course I can go out in nature, walk on the beach, et cetera, which I do, but I wanted to find a way to do that in my own home. And so I started using uh, music uh, soundtracks with embedded binaural beats and isochronic tones because I, I'm a geek like that. I like, to bring technology into, into my practice and into my personal life. And I had read up on some of the literature about using binaural beats and how they can actually walk your brain waves down from a high beta thinking down into the lower relaxed alpha and even theta range. And I knew that in the alpha and theta range is where you start getting a lot of the relaxation response kicking in when you meditate. So I was like, oh good, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this and see if I can facilitate my meditation practices because I tried sitting there just trying to narrow my thoughts and you know, let thoughts pass like a balloon, you know, the typical teachings that you get. And my mind would just spin and spin and spin and I couldn't slow it down. But when I introduced the meditation tracks, the music with the embedded beats, which is something I, I encourage in my book and my course, it really helped me to have something to focus on, which in turn took my brain and started because I was listening, my brain entrained to, and that's what it's called, entrainment, brainwave entrainment. And my brainwave entrained and it started slowing me down, slowing my brainwaves, helping me to have some really deep uh, meditations with deep relaxation responses kicking in. So 
that's how I started meditating using that type of technology. It's available all over the place, internet. Um, and so I found that when I was meditating, I was feeling better. I had more energy. I was healing faster or get a head cold or whatever. I also found that I was becoming very freaky intuitive. I had always been intuitive. I, and I thought, I just thought, I just thought it was, I thought everybody could read people <laughs> and like feel what they're feeling. I just assumed everybody could. And I talked to people about it, like, what, what are you crazy? You know, they were, they couldn't understand what I was talking about. And so then I started meditating and that ability got even better. I'm not saying I became a psychic. I'm not saying that, but I could read people even better. And that helped me in my practice because I could really feel where these people were coming from and what that emotion was that was holding them back. And a lot of times it was intense anger, intense fear. Um, and then I could kind of broach that topic with them and they'd be like, yeah, how did you know that? And, and even some weird stuff I would just know and I couldn't explain it, but it would, when I would bring it up, it would help them. It would like break a door down or open a door so that they could go there and, and tackle that issue that had been tormenting them for God knows how long, maybe childhood. Mm -hmm. So that's when I became hooked on meditation when I saw it was, it was upping my intuition game uh, to the point where it was kind of freaking me out. Um, there are some experiences I had and I'm not going to go into them because I don't want to turn it into this, you know, yeah, everybody gets to be a psychic if you meditate mm -hmm. thing, but I'm saying it will absolutely improve your intuition, which can only help your life. Yeah. So I, what I'm hearing you say in my own words that I completely agree with is, is just like our physical body wants to heal itself. I think that we also want to be in touch with our intuition. I do think that it is a part of us. And if we are in the practice of uh, not identifying ourselves as our thoughts and our emotions and our experiences, and then we get to that place where we are in this, we allow space. It's like we create space that allows us to access, I like to call it the body wisdom and the soul wisdom is what I'm calling intuition. And, right. um, and I, I, I think that there will be a point in time, like we, we just said, where functional medicine is going to be more available and more mainstream. I think the same conversation is going to, is going to happen around intuition as well. And I think that, right. you know, it won't be such because it, I, we will learn that, that this is already a part of who we are. We've just forgotten. So, right. and, and I think we're moving in that direction. So I love, and I appreciate that you shared that on this podcast. Um, I had a similar journey in my coaching practice. And um, for me, when my intuition really opened up was when I went deep into the depth of allowing myself to be vulnerable in the space of healing the trauma in my own life experience. Mm -hmm. Like I was actually, you know, I had a life threatening experience and I went to the experience where my physical body actually believed and felt and saw and experienced the whole thing over again, where I actually was afraid I might die again. And then it just, that willingness to surrender to the trust in the process just kind of created space. So um, thank, just thank you for saying that because I, I, for the listeners out there, that is a part of this podcast. It is a part of, you know, just the possibility and the empowerment, again, for the patient or the client that they can access this information through practices, through practices of listening to the body and eating intuitively, nourishing the body properly through the practice of quieting the mind or maybe, you know, or, lit, or as you suggested, finding a way to slow down the, brave, the, wa the brain wavelengths to access more space. So, and I know that empowerment is something that 
is a part of your why and why you love this work is to really um, share with people that there are other ways that they can do this. And then ultimately, what I love that you said in the very beginning of the show, because I, I wrote this down, um, it comes to acceptance. I think acceptance is like the key word when it comes to the word healing and just being present with where you are in this moment and how that shows up for you on your journey. And I think that a healthy place of your physical body, your mental thoughts, your emotional heart space, it's, it's how we are present with it in that moment. And if we can open it up for acceptance and we're not resisting it because the resistance is where the discomfort, the dis-ease and the pain shows up, when we can come to that acceptance, then we know that we're exactly where we need to be. And we allow ourselves I go to- into, Correct. That's, yeah. I go into a lot of detail in my book and course about overcoming resistance because the resistance is what creates the stress response. Yes. And people are like, what do you mean? Don't, don't resist this. I'm sick. I want to, well, you have to break it down to them. It's not about going into denial and just letting whatever overtake you. It's about accepting where you're at in that point in time and then empowering yourself to do something about it. Yes. Yeah. So has this shown up for you in your life and to be able to put it in a book, it's something that you um, obviously feel very drawn to sharing with other people. And so I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share maybe a moment where you realized that very moment of, of the acceptance versus the resistance in your own personal life. Yeah, when I had the uh, onset of the severe irritable bowel syndrome with the ulcers in my colon, um, I was in high, high resistance mode. I was frantically scurrying around, taking this nutraceutical, that nutraceutical, uh, looking for every doctor who might heal me, energy worker, just in a frantic mess because I was in high resistance mode. And once I I realized, use mindfulness to, to realize how frantic, how, res how what a state of resistance I'd, I had, it had become, I realized I was pouring gasoline on the fire. And I was like, whoa, let's step back, calm down, stop being frantic. Things are going to get better. You got to do a lot of self-talk in that process, I found. And in that process, I slowly dropped the resistance and just said, okay, this is where I'm at. I will get better. I don't have to be frantic about this. The body knows how to heal. I've got to be supportive. And all this frantic scurrying around and worrying and trying to find this and that and the right pill and potion was only making it worse. And that's when I realized mm. resistance was actually making me worse. And all the things I was doing while in a state of resistance weren't helping. So that was the, the, the light bulb. Yeah. I think for our listeners, I really want you guys to, to really receive this message. I think it, I, I believe it's really powerful and I, I see it even in my own coaching practice. There is a balance like everything in life, expansion and contraction, being and becoming, being versus doing. And this includes your own healing journey, whatever that looks like for each of us. And I know that um, in even in my practice, the women that I work with and in my own life, and sometimes it makes it harder, I would imagine even for you with your, with your background, when you have all the tools and the awareness of things that you know that if you do them, they might work. But then there's this, there's, there's this balance of, and then we take a step back and then we, we check in with, well, what is working? Like where, where am I in this moment? I, I think it's such a great message and thank you for sharing it and just remembering that, that optimal health is not achieved in the many pathways of doing and seeking all these, these avenues to health. And on this podcast, as I share all of these 
amazing healers and physicians for pathways to healing, the embodied healing self knows when it needs support and maybe it seeks one of those pathways and then it knows when it's time to rest and just be present. So thank you so much for, for sharing mm -hmm. that and shedding that light on the listeners. I, um, I really appreciate that. It's, um, and you know, I think that even more so we live in a world where it's harder to slow down and listen. It's, it, mm -hmm. it's gotten more challenging and we have access to all kinds of information. We can become our own internet prescribed doctors if we want to, you know, we can Google anything and we can go and seek all these treatments. And, and that is not always the answer toward healing. So thank right. you for doing that. Yeah, no problem. So I want to go back to your very first question, which was, you know, what's the science behind meditation? And thankfully when I was pursuing this, these topics and coming up with this course and, and book, I started researching and I found the incredible peer reviewed medical research that's being done regarding mindfulness meditation, uh, mindfulness and meditation. And it goes back to the seventies with Dr. Herbert Benson, when he first coined the term, the relaxation response. And that's basically how meditation helps the body heal is what the science is showing. Uh, when you go into a meditation and you start to create a relaxation response uh, by slowing things down, narrowing your focus, you're not going to shut your brain off. That's impossible. But you're narrowing your focus and slowing things down. And you're in setting an, and I always set an intention to relax in my meditations. And so you're cueing, the conscious mind is cueing the subconscious mind to do just that. And then you can use these meditation tracks or a guided meditation if you don't like trying to do it on your own. And then you walk your brain waves down from that high beta thinking, analytical stress response down into the alpha and then into the theta. And sometimes even lower into delta, you go into delta predominance, you're going to fall asleep in your meditation, which that's fine. Maybe your body needs to sleep a little bit. Anyway, what I found was that when you create this relaxation response, the peer reviewed medical literature shows that it changes how your genes express. And you have a, a you're born with genes that are like the blueprint for your body, but they're malleable. They can change how they express. Uh, so, and that change in how they express themselves is the, 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 uh, the outcome changes, which can be good or bad. But what they're finding with meditation research is when that, when you kick in that relaxation response, genes turn on and off that reduce oxidative stress, you know, less body rust. Uh, they will improve mitochondrial function, which improves your energy. They, you will improve your blood sugar control. It changes genes that help you improve your blood sugar control. It even preserves the ends of your chromosomes uh, called telomere, telomeres, which has an anti-aging effect. But the most consistent finding in the literature is that meditation, when you induce that relaxation response, it turns on and off genes that reduce inflammation. That is the most reproduced thing in the literature regarding the science of meditation. And why is that important? Because we know that uncontrolled inflammation is the root cause of most chronic degenerative diseases, mm -hmm. um, which that's what most people have, chronic degenerative diseases. I mean, you do need inflammation. You know, you need inflammation to help you overcome an infection. But when it goes on and on and it's uncontrolled, it results in a lot of disease, breaks down the body. The body's meant to, not meant to be in an uncontrolled inflammatory response. So that's one key way how meditation helps the body heal. There's, there's other ways too. So for our listeners, and thank you for, thank you for breaking that down scientifically. So for me, like I just knew meditation made me feel better, but I didn't know exactly why on a cellular level. And I'm wondering for the listeners, 
who might be interested in finding more on the research behind this, what, where would they go to seek this information? I know that it, there's some available in your book. And if they're looking for more of these um, medical peer reviews, is what, could you guide them in a way that where they might be able to look at more into it? Yeah, I mean, so if you don't want to buy my book, the book has a note section, which is basically all the peer reviewed research that I've incorporated. There's approximately a little over 60 peer reviewed journal articles that I've uh, so they're annotated listed, in my. And they're listed in your book. That's perfect. They, yeah. They're listed in the back of the book. And also, I've put a separate bibliography in the resources section of my course. But you can go on my website, uh, www.dr w.dr-holden.com, and I've written several articles in my blog about these topics, which include the uh, uh, citations of the peer-reviewed medical uh, literature. So those are where I would say go. Now, if you want to go on PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D.gov, that is a um, like a search engine for peer-reviewed medical journals, and you can type in meditation and research and uh, meditation and inflammation, and then you'll have a whole list pop up. Now you're not going to be able to access all of those uh, journal articles because some of them are behind paywalls, but some of them you will be able to access full mm -hmm. access. Um, but you know, if you're a researcher, that's that's what I recommend. If you're not, just go to my website or, or buy my book or my course. I hate promoting myself like that, but no, I've please, looked at the literature. Yeah, no, please do share it. It's not promoting, it's just sharing information. And I've read the book and um, it was a very easy read for me. I really appreciated the blend of uh, using the spirit, the um, the, sci the science evidence-based facts. For, I'm a former engineer, so also, you know, really love to integrate like an understanding of um, the science with what we know is our intuition and the, the, par the parts that maybe aren't so tangible and that um, we, we don't even always have answers for everything. I love the blend of that in the book. Um, so please do share it. We're going to share the book and the course and information on all of this in the show notes. So for the listeners, they can access this. And I know for myself in my life, like I have conversations with people who are seeking this information. They are seeking, you know, some of it's because, um, you know, it, it, it hasn't been around for that long and maybe just kind of where they're at in their life. They're not as familiar with it, but but there are people seeking this information. So as much as we can share this, or if you're listening and you know anybody who's, um, who's maybe struggling in some way in their health, and maybe, it sh maybe they just need to reduce their stress and come to a place of healing and acceptance, or maybe it's kind of beyond what they're getting right now, you know, from outside help, this is a really great place to start. And I love all of the things that you blended in the book together. I thought it was perfectly integrated in a way that was easy to read and understand. Um, we have a few more minutes left. I want to ask you one more question. I, I'd like to know what your thoughts are on the placebo effect. Uh, the placebo effect's my favorite of all aspects <laughs> of mind-body medicine because it proves without a doubt the power of the mind over the body. Um, I go into several, I go into a lot of discussion about the placebo effect. It has its own chapter, its own chapter in the book. It has its own module in the course. And of all of the chapters, all of the modules, it's my absolute favorite because there is so much scientific literature now showing the power of the mind over the body in regards to the placebo effect. Um, you know, I can give you a couple of examples. The placebo effect, basically the placebo is what medical researchers use to compare to the real drug to see if it's efficacious or not. And so they'll literally throw in a sugar pill. That's what they layman's term for a placebo. It, it, it has nothing in it that can physiologically change the body. It's not a medicine, but they're comparing it to a medicine. But what happens is, when you use a placebo, 
it produces physiologic changes in the body despite being an inert substance. Now, it's not inert when it comes to how it impacts the body, but the substance itself, there's nothing in it, right? So that's been boggling researchers for years. And finally, people started studying the placebo effect. Um, Harvard has their own department about placebo studies. Uh, Fabrizio Benedetti, he's out of Italy. He's one of the premier placebo effect researchers. And what they found was they had to study pl the placebo effect in the correct way. They had to um, get rid of cofactors in a study that can mimic the placebo effect, such as natural regression to the mean, uh, all these scientific ways how the they might have gotten better anyway. You know, that's one way people can get better. Um, so these researchers knew how to get rid of those factors to account for the real placebo effect. And when they did, they found that it's incredibly powerful. And it, you can quantify the placebo effect by telling someone how powerful the pill is. You, uh, one study looked at Maxol, a drug for migraines, and they gave migraine sufferers a pill, but they labeled it differently. They said, we're either going to give you Maxalt, we're going to give you the placebo, or we're going to give you a pill called placebo or Maxalt. So you see one was neutral, one was negative, one was positive. And based on how it was labeled, they quanti quantifiably changed their response to the pill as far as the migraine. So when the Maxalt was labeled Maxalt, it was 50% more effective than when the Maxalt was labeled placebo, even though it was the same drug in both instances. So you see the power of suggestion. That's, that's what is crazy about the placebo effect. But you can also, uh, when it comes to the immune system, you don't even need to, you don't even need to suggest anything verbally. You can just alter someone's response, the immune response. For example, they gave these healthy young men cyclosporin pills with a distinctly flavored drink and the I think it was flavored with saccharin. You know how distinctly flavored that is if you've ever tasted saccharin. And they gave them cyclosporin A, which is an immune suppressant. They use it in, in people getting transplants to suppress their immune system so they won't attack the transplanted organ. Anyway, so they found that when they gave them cyclosporin A and the distinctly flavored drink, it suppressed their immune system. And then they let those men's and those guys' immune systems recover, gave them the same distinctly flavored drink, but instead of cyclosporin A, they gave them five sugar pills. But because it was paired with the saccharin flavor, it suppressed their immune system. Now, how mind boggling is that? Where your body will suppress its own immune system because you drank a drink that reminded it of the drug that you took previously. So, the possibilities are endless with the placebo effect and how it can impact the body. And in the book, in the course, I go into the psychology, the psychological aspects of the placebo effect and how to actually use the tricks of the psychology of the placebo effect to, to induce your own placebo response and have a better outcome. Um, you know, and it's important that's why it's important to have a good clinician in your back pocket. You want to have a doctor that you trust. You want to have a doctor that you feel good about going and seeing because their words are highly impactful as to how it, it helps with you getting better or even you getting worse. And a lot of people have had that experience and it's, it's being scientifically shown in placebo studies how powerful the physician patient relationship is uh, and it can be helpful or detrimental. And that's why it's very important to have a doctor that you trust, a doctor that is positive and supportive and is going to help you in a way that's not creating denial about your situation, but at the same time being encouraging, creating hope and expectation. There's a fine balance there and some doctors aren't able to do it. But if you find a doctor that can help you create hope and expectation for your health outcomes, you're way ahead of the game. Yeah. Yeah. So the placebo effect has all kind of tricks up its sleeve.
and and the studies are ongoing and I, I it's I just find it incredibly fascinating. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. So um, as we come to a close, I'm, I'm, you may not remember what all of the chapters in your book off your head, or, may, or maybe you do, but what are, what are three to five key points or takeaways that a reader might get just from reading your book or taking your online course? Well, I can, I can tell you the chapters really quickly. Um, <laughs> Um, chapter one is consciousness with physical correlates. And I've created an infographic in there about how the different layers of consciousness from your soul self to your conscious mind, to your heart mind, to your subconscious mind, to your DNA mind. And those are just ways for me to categorize uh, different levels of thought and consciousness as a way to how it impacts your body. Um, then there is mindfulness and meditation. We talked about some of the epigenetic effects of, of meditation. There's a chapter on stress and how it impacts the body and changes hormones and uh, does things to your brain. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely something that we want to stay out of as a stress response. And then I go into chapter four. It's about functional medicine guidelines to optimize your health including a lot of nutrition, talk about nutraceuticals. And then chapter five, everything is energy. That's a very important component of this course because everything is energy. Our universe is energy-based. And when you look at it from that perspective, you can start to understand why prayer works, why, why the power of the mind works. It's all about energy. And then chapter six is the science of heart consciousness. And I go into a lot of the research that the Heart Math Institute has done, the power of the electromagnetic field of your heart. It contains the power of unconditional love. And as we know, that's probably the most powerful force in the universe. I go into, about, I go into the studies they've done and how to make your heart consciousness work for you in a positive way. And then chapter seven is your subconscious mind and brainwave states. We've touched on brainwave states. Uh, the subconscious mind is like your supercomputer. It memorizes everything. The problem is it gets littered with limiting beliefs. Uh, a lot of them originate in your childhood because from about zero to age seven, your brain's highly malleable and you don't have a clear idea of cause and effect. And because of that, you get a lot of limiting beliefs stuck in there. And then that because your subconscious mind is always filtering your everyday experiences, it muddies the water. So if you don't clean up your limiting beliefs and become aware of them and how they originated and work with them to process them and let them go, you can keep making the same mistakes in your life over and over and over. Example, dating the guy that beats you up and it's, here he comes again and you just, you know, that's just a drastic example. And then chapter eight, belief versus truth. You know, not every belief is a truth, no matter how hard you hold it. And I talk about ways to discern truth versus just a generic belief. And then we talk about removing limiting beliefs. There's a, um, and then chapter nine is the mind is a healer, detail after detail about the placebo effect. And then chapter 10 is the higher mind. And that's about connecting with your soul self. That's the spiritual aspect of, of the course. So Which that's is kind of... <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, so speaking of energy, you know, just the question and witnessing you share about your book, like you just totally lit up on the screen. So it's clear. Yeah. That it's, a, it's a passion of yours. I mean, your whole energy just, you really stepped into your place of empowerment in what your connection to higher self is in mm. sharing the work that you do, which is this book. It was very um, you know, I know this is going to be available on a podcast and some of the video will be shared, but I just completely witnessed you completely <sighs> light up. So thank, thank, thank you for that. noticing that. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was a gift for me too. And, um, you know, just in closing, I want to just, I really want to, um, extend my gratitude to you because your book and your course and what you shared and for our connection and our relationship which was short as a doctor or patient and how that came about really shifted the course of the work that I do it shifted my own healing path 
Um, I now integrate spiritually based life coaching. I've done training on um, healing trauma and emotional well being with the health coaching because because of some of the things that I learned in your book and were also happening in my life at the same time. So um, yeah. thank you. It's been an honor to share you with listeners and share the work that you do because I believe so deeply in your message and your work. So thank well, you. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate you. <laughs> I appreciate you too. Is there, is there anything in closing that you'd like to share with the listeners? If there's just a, a little message or anything that you'd like to say before we come to a close. You know, my favorite phrase is things aren't always as they seem. And that's why it's always important to have an open mind about changing your beliefs. Uh, because sometimes beliefs, no matter how hard you hold on to it, will take you down a very dark path. And that's why it's very important to use meditation and mindfulness to tap into your intuition so that your discernment really goes up as high as it can so that you can make the best decisions for yourself in life. And that includes changing your beliefs. And that's kind of how I want to end that. And I'm going to leave, uh, get, send you a link for a very discounted uh, course link for all your followers. Yes, thank you. I was just going to ask you next, how can the listeners find you on social media or your website? Would you just be willing, willing to share those again? Yeah, so um, I guess you're going to put my social media uh, names in the show links. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, and then my, like I've said before, www.dr-holden.com, that's my website. And then you can find links to my course on my website, or you can go directly to Udemy, U-D-E-M-Y.com. And the course is Power of the Mind in Health and Healing. The book by the same name, it's on Amazon, it's on iTunes, it's on Barnes & Noble. Uh, easy to find. Just type in my name, it should pop up. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you, uh, and I appreciate the work you do. And uh, thank you, I'm honored. To be on your uh, show. Oh, thank you so much for being here. And I will have all of those links in the show notes, including the very generous um, discount that he's offering for the listeners. The course is normally offered at 149 and he is sending a link to offer it to you for 19, 19.99 or somewhere around there. So really just um, invite you to check this out. Like, just to receive this for you as a gift to yourself to empower you on your path to healing for those of you that are listening. So thank you so much, Keith. I really appreciate the work that you do and you as a human being. And I'm just honored to share this space with you. So thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Jen. Appreciate you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.